watched episode three of Star Wars The Acolyte, and it just might be the worst episode of Star Wars yet. Let's talk about it. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better. Guys, before we get into today's video, please like and subscribe. You know that I'm subjecting myself to today's entertainment, if we can even call it that, so I can let you guys know what's going on, how woke it is. And in episode three of Star Wars The Acolyte, we're reaching peak levels. I saw this coming, but we're also reaching very low levels of storytelling. <laughs> So let's unpack it. So in episode three of Star Wars The Acolyte, we start off by meeting young Mei and young Osha. We are going back in time here a little bit, I believe about 16 years. And we are at their village in Berendok, where they live in a coven of female witches. In this village-like community, we have a thriving matriarchy of just women, except for one trans character. And funnily enough, this trans actor in this episode is one of the few, I'll say, side characters that actually gets multiple lines of dialogue. No one does womanhood better than a biological man, as I say. We learn that in this coven of witches, May and Osha are the only children and they are children in training. What are they training for? To become witches in a ceremony known as the Ascension Ceremony, where I guess they take on their final witch form when it comes to their magic and they will be able to carry on the legacy of their mothers. Yes, two mothers who raised and created these two Two young twins. May and Osha are the only children living in Brendock amongst the coven, and if you're wondering how two lesbian women had two twin daughters, we'll get to that in just a moment. In their training as young witches, May and Osha are learning how to control the thread. What is the thread, you ask? Well, it's the Force. And why have they seemingly changed the name of the Force? Well, apparently the thread is something that this coven of witches has always had knowledge of and has been one with, and the Jedi sort of appropriated it and made it into the force and it's a force that they don't truly understand, according to one of the mother witches in this episode. May and Osha's mother in this episode says that the thread is not a power you wield, but if you pull the thread, it changes everything. Make it make sense? I don't know. It's made clear in these younger depictions of May and Osha that May is sort of on board with everything that's going on. She wants to become a witch. She wants to continue on the legacy of the coven, and Osha is not so sure about it. She's not interested in becoming a witch, and she wants to know what else is out there in the world. Although she doesn't have any knowledge of it because she's born and raised here on Brendock and has never been exposed to anything going on in the outside world. The reason these two have had no access or exposure to the outside world is because their mother says that the outside world is not accepting of witches and women like them. Now we all know director and writer of this series, Leslie Headland, also happens to be a lesbian woman and I have a feeling a bit of her insecurity or personal story and struggle is being injected into the plot here. Do you see it because I do. But I would have been able to understand as a queer person and I think I, I would have had a completely different life. And so I really was inspired by it and was like, God, I would love to make a story like this. Then we find ourselves at the Ascension Ceremony where May and Osha are meant to become full witches, essentially. And it's looking an awful lot like those old witches tales that you watch on Halloween. Everybody's in their cloaks and hoods and they're gathering around saying a bunch of nonsense. Power one, the power of two, the power of many, the power of one. May goes through her ceremony first without a hitch, and she becomes a witch and now has a little marking on her face. Osha very hesitantly says that she agrees to becoming a witch, but they are suddenly cut off from the ceremony when four Jedi show up. Indara, Torben, Telnaka, and Sol. They interrupt the ceremony to ask the coven whether or not they've been training children, which is apparently a no-no. The coven denies May and Osha are in hiding, but they end up stepping out and revealing themselves to the Jedi. Upon their reveal, Jedi Sol says that May has a marking on her face that she did not have this morning. And the coven finds out that the Jedi has been spying on them. For how long, we don't know. And I do have a question here. If the Jedi was watching this coven, knew that they had children, and knew that they were training them, why did they wait until the middle of a ceremony where one of those children had already become a witch to interrupt them and to cause a scene? Honestly, I don't know. Hopefully this is a plot hole that gets figured out as we continue through this series, but so far I have no answers. At this point, Osha gets to see the Jedi, 
seemingly for the first time, and I guess she's thinking, cool robes, cool lightsaber, and she suddenly decides that she wants to be a Jedi. Well, she's in luck because the Jedi decide they're going to come back and test the girls to see if they qualify to be trained under the Jedi Order. Never mind the fact that they'll be stepping away and leaving these girls with a coven of witches that had already turned one of them into a full-on witch and was working on doing the other one. We'll just come back when daylight comes around and we'll test them. The witches congregate and come up with a plan to have both girls lie and fail the test. The Jedi return, start testing the girls. May purposefully fails the test. Osha then goes to take her Jedi test, which consists of her being shown pictures of things from the outside world and having to guess what they are. At first she tries to lie and answer the questions incorrectly, but she ends up getting caught. The one question I was left with is how the hell would Osha know what is in these pictures she's being shown by the Jedi if she's never had any exposure to the outside world? She didn't even know what a Jedi was until they showed up, but nonetheless, she goes through this test and she somehow passes. Osha goes on to have this entire back and forth with one of her moms where they talk about the possibility of being a Jedi, the fact that she will never see her family again, and Osha is like, I don't care, girl, I wanna be a Jedi, bye. And we have this weird interaction where the mom is telling Osha essentially that she knows who she is and that she should not be guided by fear in her decision to become a Jedi or stay home. And of course, Osha chooses Jedi, which is an irreversible decision that will leave her never seeing her family again. And the mom is just like, Sure, you've made your choice, little kid. And Osha is largely encouraged to pass this test by Jedi Soul, who has what is supposed to be a heartfelt moment with her, where they talk about how when he was a child at four years old, he also knew that he was meant to be a Jedi and that he was different from the people around him and that he needed to fulfill his own purpose and follow what he wanted to do at four years old. He says something to the effect of, what do you want, Osha? I was only four when I knew I was different from my family. The Jedi saw how special I was. I can see that in you, Osha. I was scared to leave my family, but when I joined the Jedi, I found out there were many other children like me. You must have the courage to say what you want, to tell the truth. And this might be me reading into the script a little bit here, guys, but does that sound at all familiar to the little gender speeches that we're giving children right now about them knowing who they are at four years old, and even if their family doesn't accept them, there are more children out there like them. And when you mix that with the idea that there's already a trans actor on the cast in this show who's given more lines than the other women, Leslie Headland's own identity, and the fact that she wants to make this a queer story, it seems like the math is mathing. So that's that. May's going to stay behind, and Osha is going to leave her family and become a Jedi. But when May finds out about this news, she decides, uh-uh, it ain't happening. The little evil twin has has gotta corrupt this whole process. So May shows up as Osha's getting ready to leave, steals a little notebook of hers, and says, you know what? If you think you're gonna leave with the Jedi, you're not, I'm gonna kill you. May locks her in a room, sets her notebook on fire, throws it on the ground, and I guess that starts an even larger fire in this stone building that they're all living in. Osha narrowly escapes the room where the fire was started and goes out into Brendock and sees that virtually everything has been set aflame. How the the fire that started in that one room spread that far? I don't know, but maybe this is a plot hole that gets cleared up once we learn what the Jedi's true involvement was in this major breakdown that we see on Brendock. And I do have a strong feeling that this inexplicable fire is going to get cleared up, unlike the space fire that we got in episode one. Yep, the space fire. So Osha's running around seeing that all of Brendock is set aflame. She also sees May, who's a ways away and unreachable, who's also running around seeing that all of Brendock Doc is set aflame. They try to get to one another, but end up on two sides of one bridge structure where they can't get to one another. Jedi Soul shows up in the midst of all this craziness and sees May and Osha trying to create some sort of plan to jump across the open structure to one another. But before they get to that, both of the bridges start to collapse. May ends up falling and is unable to be saved, and Osha is grabbed by Soul, who gets to her before she falls to her demise. Now, why Jedi Soul did not use the Force to save them in this episode, I have no idea, considering that he did use the Force to save Osha in a prior episode of this very same series. I can't figure it out. Maybe it's because he's not yet a Jedi Master and he doesn't have full power over the Force yet, but again, 
I don't know. You guys will have to fill me in on that. Anyways, he saved Osha. They need to escape and get out of Brendock. And on their way out, they see all the dead bodies of the coven that was once living and thriving in their matriarchy. Interestingly, the women are not burned. There's no rubble on top of them. They're just all lying on the ground, not moving. So how they died, I do not know. Maybe we will also fill up this plot hole a little bit later in the series. And we close out this episode with Sol telling Osha that she will in fact be a Jedi and that she will train and that everything will be okay. Meanwhile, May wakes up in the middle of a field somewhere, I'm assuming on Brandok, completely unscathed after everything she went through, and she's looking around for Osha to no avail. And there you have episode three of Star Wars The Acolyte. Lesbian space witches who have immaculate conceptions of twins. The force is actually an appropriation of the thread, and a young girl comes out of the closet as a Jedi. What I gathered from this episode is what we've known from the initial announcement that Star Wars The Acolyte was being made, and being made by none other than Leslie Headland, that this was going to be a Leslie Headland story and not a Star Wars story. There are so many plot holes and things that don't make sense. There are so many things that maybe make sense, but completely fly in the face of the original IP of Star Wars and Star Wars lore and canon. And even if they're not contradicting canon, they're contradicting the laws of physics and what we've known from prior episodes. It's almost as if the person creating this show cared more about the messaging and their personal story than they did about storytelling itself. Put a chicken in it, make her gay! And even when the story feels quite neutral and you're just going along with the motions, you can tell that whoever wrote this show does not trust the audience. They're constantly explaining exactly what's happening as you're watching it, as if they feel you are too stupid to follow the plot. The characters are flat, the plot points are contrived, and the acting feels mediocre, but I can't tell if that's due to bad actors or just bad writing, making it nearly impossible to buy in and truly invest in the story that you're watching. And if I'm saying this as an outsider to Star Wars and the Star Wars franchise, franchise, I can't imagine how hardcore fans of Star Wars feel about this project. Although I think they're giving us a few clues with that 19% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Star Wars The Acolyte seems like it's going to be a flop because it should have never been a Star Wars story to begin with. If Leslie Headland and her entire team wanted to tell a queer space story, they could have done exactly that and maybe made something original. And while Disney and Disney executives like Kathleen Kennedy have been saying that they truly want to respect the vision and creation of George George Lucas, they've done anything but that. And with that, I might call time of death on this series. I don't know that I can subject myself to any more of Star Wars The Acolyte. You can let me know in the comments down below if you truly want me to keep going and go episode by episode on this series, but I don't know whether or not I'm willing to commit to that at this point. But guys, I would love to hear your thoughts on the series if you're watching it. How do you score it? How do you feel about it? Are you a hardcore Star Wars fan? Are you an outsider like me? Let me know in the comments down below. Below. And if you like this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time I post a video for you guys, which is every day, and I will see you next time. May the thread be with you. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better.